adjusting their thinking than just sort of collecting homework and grading it. Behind us, there are seven student teachers who are observing this lesson as a part of their basic training. They are required to observe a large number of lessons, and not only just observe them, but then go back and, in small groups, critique and discuss those lessons. We have very little testing, perhaps, you know. Yes. We don't have practically any testing until the end of the high school. Yeah, the matriculation exam. Yes. The more relaxed atmosphere that characterizes classrooms now seems to facilitate and improve learning and student motivation. We, we try to all the time say that it's up to you that you learn. Yes. And this is good for your future and it's fun to learn. So what did students have to do? You wanted them to understand this theorem. You I just wanted them to discover the theorem. To discover it? Ah. Discover the theorem. Well, that's a really important yes, distinction, isn't right. it? Yes, yes. The emphasis is not so much on mechanical performance, but on using math in concrete situations mm -hmm. and sort of understanding the math. Mm -hmm. Our school system is very much oriented toward, toward this kind of understanding and reading and also some problem solving and this kind of things. Mm -hmm. Teachers have always been revered in Finland. In the villages, they were the wise elders that people went to for advice and so on. But what is particularly striking about the Finnish story is how they have changed the nature of teaching. Teachers are no longer assembly line workers. Page 87 by October 5 in the textbook. They have become knowledge workers working collaboratively, thinking of their classroom as their laboratory for continuous innovation trying to understand how to ensure that all students achieve at very, very high levels. Teachers uh, are the ones who facilitate students to create, to do knowledge work together. And this kind of a knowledge co-creation happens in these learning environments. Today, teachers in Finland lead this kind of a multi-professional uh, work together with those who, who work in libraries, science centers, museums. If you want to become a teacher, you have to do pretty well and also you have to have pretty high marks, high grades to be able to enter the university. And if you do well, then you might be, might be accepted. Not everybody who, who succeeds really well and has good grades, they are not automatically accepted. In a lot of countries, teaching is something that those people who can't get other jobs do. But in Finland, it's a job where people apply to the teacher education and to be teachers. So it's, it's, it's an esteemed uh, profession. Young people in Finland, they want to be teachers. And we get very competent teacher students. We have five-year study programs for all teachers, both class teachers and subject teachers. Subject teachers, they major in their subject and class teachers, they major in their in, uh, educational studies. So it's uh, three years uh, of bachelor's and two years of master's. I've been a student, it's quite rare that all teachers have the university master's degree. Yes. I think most countries don't have that. It's, it's probably uh, one factor. The main reasons for our success, I would say, that it's teacher education, that we're able to, 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 that we have teachers that all have masters. We call it a research-based teacher education. And it means that it's much more important to learn to think pedagogically and be a reflective, inquiry-oriented teacher. Even if you do extremely well in both your matriculation examination and have good grades in your report card, you cannot just walk in. So you have to do well also in the entrance examination. And for that you have to study quite, quite a lot, I'm afraid, because uh, the percentage you get who manage to start their studies at the university, that's quite low in Finland. We have much more applicants than what we can take in. So teachers' profession is very, very uh, highly appreciated here in Finland. This year there were 1,600 uh, applicants and we could take in only 10% of those people. But if you manage to get into the university, so you start um, your subject studies, 
they have to have a degree in the subjects that they teach. They have uh, lessons, they have tutorials, they have small group discussions at the university. Then they sit down with the supervising teacher and then we actually start planning the lesson or lessons. They write a lesson plan, usually they plan their own teaching. We discuss it and then uh, they, they make the changes, they send it back to me again. And then they give their lesson. After that we have a quick feedback session with the students who have also been observing the class. These feedback sessions, they are very, very important. Actually, it takes a lot more time to actually fulfill one, one, full, fulfill one lesson. So it means that uh, uh, the students we get in, they are very motivated and they are very, very uh, um, well educated when they come in. So they are very high quality students. Of course, sometimes we do have uh, cases where we just have to say that, okay, maybe you should uh, do something else. <laughs> but this is not maybe your, your place, but very rarely. <laughs> The beginning of the class is used as either warm up or cool down. The teachers talk about it in different ways, but it's a way of relaxing the kids and also engaging them. I'm also struck by the fact that this teacher has never seen this group of kids before, but his rapport and his interaction with them is just wonderful. They're lively, interesting, fun, but also very academically demanding. <laughs> He's using very current events to actually teach a fairly basic content at the moment. The, the three questions at the top of each slide is, who is this person, what is the ministry, and what is the political party? Fascinating debate taking place now. Um, the student teacher just put out the frameworks for comprehensive education that was approved by the ministry some years ago. And the student just said, well, do you think the ministry has lived up to the promises they've made about what a good comprehensive education should be? So now they're debating the quality of the education they've received versus what was being promised to them. Whole group asked very Tough question, yes. maybe, I think. Yes. But, but fortunately, you have very good uh, knowledge of the subject. Not a once you were lost. What do you think about the uh, lesson? I thought it was uh, very nice. Um, I wouldn't have spoken so much in the lesson, and, and I would have given them more space. But it's a difficult subject, uh, and they ask questions all the time so it took the time. The challenge for any of us as teachers is what uh, Ted Sizer said, which he said that less is more. Yeah. Doing yeah. less, going in greater depth. Yeah. Again, maybe too much talk from me mm -hmm. and I like to have a little bit more activity for students. Yes. I understand also your problem that you have you have had so much to teach that it's very difficult to cut. They observe our classes in multi-subject groups. So all those who are considering coming to the teaching practice follow lessons given by us. We just teach. We do our everyday work mm -hmm. and they follow us. So you're really modeling the behavior uh, or behavior being of transparency, right? You're having whole groups of kids, future teachers, come in and watch you teach. It's true. And in part, which, as I hear you say this, you're saying that this is the norm. That the norm is we're going to watch each other teach all the time. Is, is, that, a, is that a fair summary? The stage is open for everybody. You could drop into any classroom here and watch. And it's also encouraged before they start teaching themselves. So we have these, these observation sessions uh, ongoing all the time. And they're, they're told what to be looking for? This, the questions that, that we have des designed for that purpose is they are quite simple. 
what did you see? It, it, it could be one question. <coughs> what would you have done differently? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about some points? Three very simple questions, mm -hmm. because we realized these three simple questions might, in a way, lead their concentration to, to the to content. So this is a Swedish class. It's been taught entirely in Swedish, and this is a student teacher who is giving a formal lesson that was co-constructed, put together with the master teacher, who is observing here in the back, along with several other student teachers. The teacher trainer has sent me the lesson plan by email on Sunday, and I have been commenting on her plan and ideas through email correspondence. And she's been reviewing it and sending it back to me. What I do now during the lesson, I have the lesson plan in front of me and I comment on it, looking at the things she does and probably giving her hints what could have been done differently. And she gets right away my comments after the class. Of course, we also discuss the lesson face to face after the class. She's quite well using other material, for example, a YouTube video and text from other resources, but going back to the actual resource textbooks after these introductory sections. John Goodlad in his studies of high schools in the 1980s discovered that the teacher talk time comprised 85% of the lessons in American high schools across all content areas. So what are you seeing here in terms of teacher talk time versus student work time? I would like to see that it would be 60% the student and 40% teacher. And I'm going to give a feedback to her that every time she would have had a chance to throw the ball in the classroom, mm -hmm. she should have done it. So can you say a little bit about why you chose that video? Why did you show it? The theme of this lesson was the future and what the what these 15-year-old people are going to do after this class. They're going to high school or, or whatever. The song was quite good for to support the theme and I've learned that it's good to to use just music or some listening comprehension exercises or something like that to cool down the class mm -hmm. and uh, I've experienced that it works. Listening comprehension exercises and music is the best way to calm down a class that is a bit how do you say it? Well, not that calm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I've just spent the day observing classes, talking to teachers and students, and trying to better understand what is it that actually happens in classrooms that accounts for these extraordinary results. Several things we observed that were in common to all of these classes. These classes really focused on teaching students how to think. Uh, giving students a sense of, of being able to really actively engage in their learning, uh, not penalizing mistakes. Finally, I was struck by the attention to detail of, in the ways in which uh, these master teachers work with student teachers in their classes. There is a technique, a methodology, if you will, a national curriculum for preparing these teachers so that they get a great deal of classroom experience, they get a great deal of coaching on how to become a better teacher, and there's a clear understanding about what, in fact, is good teaching. In Finland, we have got a high living standard, and um, and almost everybody can can travel and have have houses, and and it's it's enough. It was very satisfied for me to hear from my daughter that she doesn't want anything more. So I I think it's good to have this and spend time to things that you like to do with people you love.
We've had a chance to explore what Finnish students do in the classroom, but what do they